Welcome back to the Cutting Edge Stage at COGX 2021. I'm your MC, Jess Wade, a research fellow at Imperial College London. Please remember to tweet throughout the next few days using the hashtag, hashtag COGX2021. We're now shifting from the quantum world to an exciting tech innovation and one which you may not be too familiar with. This afternoon, we're gonna talk about spatial computing. Think attaching the ultra precise sensing devices we discussed earlier today to different objects and using the cloud to let them communicate with one another. Spatial computing would let compute co computer coordinators track and even control their interaction. Your moderator for this session is Kathy Hackle, best selling author and tech futurist, who was recently featured in the 60 Minutes coverage of the metaverse. Kathy is going to tell you more about our phenomenal speakers, Erho and Tom. Please remember to use the Q&A function to ask your questions. I'll see you again after the session. Thank you so much, Jess. I'm really excited to be here moderating this panel. Uh, today, I am joined by Tom Carter, the CTO and co-founder of Ultraleap, as well as Urho Kondori, the, the co-founder and chief technology officer at Vario. Um, hi, hi, Tom and Urho. Thanks, uh, thanks for joining us today for this spatial computing. Let the you know let the spatial computing revolution begin panel, which I'm really, really excited about. Um, so maybe you know I want to start us off with some you know brief introductions. So uh, Tom and Urho, can you briefly introduce yourselves and maybe share a little bit about your roles at Ultra Leap and then at Vario? So Tom, do you want to start us off? Sure, thanks, Kathy. Um, so, hi, hey, everybody. I'm Tom. I'm the CTO and one of the co-founders at Ultraleap. Um, at Ultraleap, we make two primary technologies. One is hand tracking, which takes images of hands from a from a camera and turns them into real time through models of hands. So you can use your hands to interact rather than controllers. And then the other is what we call mid air haptic feedback that actually uses sound waves projected through the air. To, to project a sense of touch and enable you to feel what you're doing when you're interacting in uh, in spatial computing. Um, and my role as a CTO is looking after the, uh, the, the technology direction um, as we make that meta first come true. Yeah, and I'm Ura Kontori. So I'm, as, as Cathy said, I'm one of the founders of the company. And I was also the CEO for the first two years of the company, getting it basically started. Now, at this stage, Vario is five years old startup from Helsinki, Finland. So like um, uh, age old when it comes to startup lifetimes. Uh, we make the world's best virtual reality and mixed reality headsets by far. Uh, we decided from the very beginning to focus on the professional use cases and start solving the problems that people have dreamed to solve uh, through the VR and mixed reality technologies and just push it so that we're using the utmost best technology possible at all times so that we are able to accelerate the whole development of the immersive paradigm um, by multiple years and stay ahead of the commercial and, and consumer great uh, devices, basically enabling companies to start the proper revolution uh, in their uh, respective industries. Vario is now 150 people growing fast, over 100, 100 million in investments. Our customers are like the companies in the aviation space, for example, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Airbus, many governmental uh, uh, bodies in, in both uh, civilian as well as in, in defense uh, related industries. We cannot speak about those much. Um, then we have automotives and different types of consumer electronics companies uh, who are designing their future products using uh, Vario products and as well as, of course, with the Ultralib products as well. And, and companies like Audis, BMWs, Volvos, Volkswagens, these kind of companies. Then plenty of universities uh, as well as um, entertainment companies these days as well. We, we haven't spoken much of those recently, but soon again, uh, uh, the post-COVID world will open up to, to also the entertainment cases, I hope. Yeah, and, and Urho, it's it's interesting because I work with a lot of clients in defense. I, I'm based right outside Washington, D.C., and Vario always comes up, <laughs> always comes up when we have conversations around spatial computing. So, so yeah, you guys are definitely, you know, and you're, I think your headquarters is in the D.C. area. Your U.S. Yeah. headquarters is in this area yes. as well. Yeah, we chose it uh, very specifically mm -hmm. because that's where most of the action is when it comes to the, to the governmental bodies in USA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, so I want to kind of, before we go down the spatial computing rabbit hole, um, I do want people to know a little bit about the partnership um, between Ultraleap and Vario. So maybe Tom and Norho, can you guys share a little bit more about that partnership, why you guys are collaborating, how is this helping move the industry forward? Sure. Shall I, uh, shall I, shall I jump first? Um, so I, I think we actually met back in at a founders forum. So it would have been this week, two years ago. Um, yeah. and, uh, and that's where we sort of first started talking and discussing and got the idea of, uh, of integrating ultra leap hand tracking into Vaya's, uh, second generation headsets. Um, and for us, that made total sense because we have best performance hand tracking in the world. Uh, so to marry that up with Vario's headsets, which are really, really pushing the boundaries and like right at the forefront with a sort of an unmatched display uh, to kind of put those two pieces of the puzzle together um, was it was a really obvious thing for us to do. Um, and then I think I'm right that that we managed to between us do the integration within about three months or so. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's and that record to be, speed. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. it was a sp speedy, uh, speedy journey. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I mean, uh, just echoing on the on on the same tone. So so uh, like uh, Ultra Leap is the industry's by far the best hand tracking provider on the planet. So it was natural that we only give our customers the best possible experience, and we were completely lacking uh, the uh, the interaction capabilities uh, for many of the, especially the industrial use cases tend to be that you want to be training how you would operate in real life, which is Typically, not with controllers, but it is with real human hands, and and hence we felt that uh, this is just match made in heaven. We would not actually have made a second generation product had it not been uh, us meeting at the founders forum and realizing that okay, we actually have everything in place that we could kick those off this thing into a high gear, and and then in. I think it was in uh, Augmented World Expo in end of August that we announced the VR2 Pro product that then we felt was the was the perfect fit uh, and, and had a few other things, but the major thing really was the uh, integration of the interaction. And, and things weren't so fast, so incredible. We were able to just take the module that, uh, that the Ultraleap had developed and uh, integrate that directly into the headset. Um, and, and do a small tune-up of the mechanics, very little, and then uh, just like uh, do the logistics, get the factory ramping up and, and so forth. So it was pretty incredible, yeah. Yeah, that, that's so exciting. And I'm so glad it was so like serendipitous. You guys met at a found a conference, right? Um, and then, you know, fast tracked everything. That's amazing. I, it's always exciting to hear when founders kind of come together to push their products further. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about the use of spatial computing and how you guys are seeing your clients uh, using these. So maybe, you know, what are some of the so some of the solutions that they're using today? What have been some of the great wins or some of the challenges even that you guys have seen? So, Tom, do you want to start us off? Yeah, sure. I, I think that yeah. um, uh, Udo and Vario have, uh, have a lot of really, really great uh, use cases, which you kind of touched on a little bit there. So I'll, I'll try and uh jump out into into some uh less conventional use cases potentially um to try and sort of broaden the field but um to pick up a couple of my favorites one is uh it's a company called um r3dt and they create software that enables you to sort of prototype and design industrial layouts so if you're creating a new factory or a new production line you can actually uh, sort of build it in in virtual reality test it out and actually like practice operating with it. So you can practice doing the uh, the assembly steps if you're if you're on a, an assembly production line and make sure that all of the containers are in arm's reach, everything's done with hand tracking. So you can sort of really uh, simulate what it's like to, to be in that environment. Uh, and then obviously still with the hand tracking, still no controls, you can uh, adjust your environment, change the layout, change the settings, both at small scale and at sort of larger scale of entire, uh, in, entire units and uh, sort of corridors of uh, of stations that you sit at, um, and it's super valuable for the uh, for the end users. They can like hone their their design, hone their setup, have uh, pretty large cost savings, sort of in the region of thirty percent or so. Um, but the, uh, the 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 main thing which I didn't realize before, um, sort of when I first saw the three D uh, RD three D 
uh, R3 DT product uh, is that the way this used to happen was actually using cardboard. So people would spend like multiple days cutting out cardboard, gluing and sticking these things together to try and mock up what it would be like, test it out and then tear it all down and have to sort of do it again next time you wanted to do an iteration. So um, for me, that's a really cool one of being able to prototype and move quickly and like perfect example of, uh, of using VR and, and your hands. And then to, to, to jump to something like almost completely different, another of my uh, of, of my favorites is by a company called Embodied Labs. Mm -hmm. And Embodied Labs enables you to experience what it's like to live with a number of different sort of common diseases, particularly in, uh, in, in, in later life. So things like Alzheimer's and mm -hmm. uh, macular degeneration. And um, it's really powerful stuff because uh, rather than sitting through a training course where you uh, you know, read slides or read a book or listen to a lecture about what it's like, you actually get to put the headset on and kind of become uh, somebody living with uh, with one of these conditions uh, and experience it in the first person. Um, and that's, a, that, that's a, a completely different way of learning, a, a, a much more powerful, much faster way of learning from, uh, from, from, from what I can see. And it's got the combination of actually having your hands that move as your hands, like hugely increases that that sense of embodiment, that sense that it is really you, you are uh, in that uh, in that situation, and also um, it lowers the learning curve. So it, the uh, the company Embodied Labs finds that it actually takes uh, less effort and time for users that they're sort of getting through the, the training to learn how to just. You interact with the world with their hands in the way that you uh, that you would in the uh, uh, in the real world than it does teaching them what button does what on a controller. Um, and when you're trying to get somebody to a training course where they're probably uh, sort of possibly a little bit impatient every minute that you can uh, that you can focus on the training rather than the setup of how to do the training uh, makes a difference. So yeah, those are those are two of my favorites. Yeah, and I know the CEO of Embody Lab. She's a woman. She's fantastic. She's in my Women in XR group. Brilliant company, brilliant use. So, yeah, uh, big shout out to her for sure. Um, so, Urho, can we uh, can we talk a little bit about how your clients are using the solutions? Sure. Um, you know, any wins, challenges? Definitely, you know, let's explore that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So, so um, as mentioned, like a lot of our customers are, uh, for example, in the like training and simulations industry. It's it's maybe the biggest uh, of our three verticals at the moment. The split is maybe roughly 30, 30, 30, but not quite. I think the, especially now in the uh, this COVID year, we have had like a huge traction in the training and simulations industry. And in there, for example, just as a um, quick uh, instance, Boeing has been using our headsets to train astronauts how to uh, fly their um, uh, uh, fly to the ISS space station, do the, all of the docking procedures, and do that one in a collaborative fashion so that the two astronauts who are synchronizing their activities might not actually be in physically in the same place. One of them could be in Austin, Texas. The, uh, Texas, the other one is, is in New York. And through, through the uh, Vario headsets and the immersive technologies, when they put the headsets on, they feel like they're actually in the same um, uh, uh, same cockpit, uh, seeing each other, acting naturally, doing all of the engagement, speaking to each other, and it becomes like a fully effective training uh, uh, course, and you didn't have to travel for a few days to to complete that one. Um, uh, like, um, that's not very mass market use case, obviously. In the uh, very similar thing is happening in the aviation industry, like, so much happening so fast at the moment in the defense industry with getting pilots not learning how to fly for the first time that particular plane, but training how to fly their next mission, which is again like a pushing the volume of the of the uh, uh, like a learning events to a completely new level. You're not only doing it once per person, uh, but you're doing it maybe once per week, a few times per week for each individual pilot in your um, Air Force or similar uh, uh, body. Uh, and that's that's like a super interesting, and it's of course leveraging that uh, that uh, plane simulators are not a new thing, right? So they, they have been around since 
70s uh, already and and uh, starting from cardboard prototypes though for those as well uh but now of course they're fully immersive so you feel like you're actually in the plane and you operate all of the like every single instrument in the same way as you would in in real life as well and of course with hand tracking you can then uh, accomplish uh, it get to learn that cockpit really well and and uh, your uh, particular mission quite a lot of our customers also utilize then that at least part of the cockpit is physical and then with our mixed reality heads you just see your physical hand and when you touch a button well it's a physical button so it gives you the exact same haptical feel as the real life and then you can extend it so that the rest of the not so like important activities can still be fully virtual and you engage with those still with your hands you just don't get the full haptical feel as you would in in, in the cockpit instrumentation so um that's that's a pretty huge thing and of course training uh overall like broadly sensely speaking it's it's a very similar activity whether you learn how to like uh, fix an electric cabinet or how to fly a plane like the same same uh, uh, physical realities are all behind there. Now, what I thought was really interesting, what uh, Tom just said about this, uh, like cardboard pro prototyping, is that the car companies have been doing like uh, extremely fast transformation into collaborative virtual design tools. So of course, they also used to be doing always when you had like a new design, you would do like a clay model of the car. It would be like a, maybe a week's effort. It depends on the on which company you ask. Some some say it's it's two weeks. Some say it's four days. Depends on the quality that they want to have. But basically, they have a huge machine that CNCs uh, a clay model of the car based on the CAD drawings. Then it gets uh, painted. Then it gets varnished. And then ultimately, the design teams comes to look at the beautiful details of the car and the reflections on the body and so forth. Well. Turns out that through COVID, that was no longer possible. So, mm -hmm. for example, our friends at Kia, what they did is that um, uh, as they have design centers all around the world, and, and we worked uh, very closely with the Frankfurt office and the uh, Korean office, and, and they changed their way of, uh, previously, they used to fly from uh, Germany to Korea once a month for one month, uh, like a sync up. And, um, now COVID pushing it so that was not possible anymore so what happened instead they put the her uh, warrior headsets on in uh, each uh, facility some even at home and then they are looking at the car uh, model that they have been designing and and they see it material accurate true to life with all the possible details you could actually have and with warrior headsets you see it like that and then of course with ultra leap when you are actually then discussing about it, of course you hear the voices of the people, but then you see also their intent and their like a physical um, vocabulary also speaking at the same time as you're like looking at the things and and discussing about them. And they went from once a month activity first into once a week activity, and very quickly already in September last year they switched to so that the teams were meeting every other day so that they would have like a one day of working on the models and then every second day they would talk about it and refine it and they said that it stopped being like uh, two different teams at two different countries working and it became that they started feeling that they're actually the same like properly the same company they're the same team and it's like a joint activity and not something where you're like kind of a little bit scared to go to the hq and meet the uh, <laughs> meet the decision makers over there but it became like so that it's a it's a one family working together and and that's the kind of like thing of course that i think all of us are looking and yearning in the immersive technologies like making communication more humane and mm -hmm. making uh making us more productive yet do it in mm -hmm. a in a familiar and humane way so yeah so, so that's a great, great segue into my next que next question, which is about human centered interaction with technology. So, you know, let's talk about hand tracking, haptics, human eye resolution, which obviously Vario is the leader in. Um, you know, how do each of your products help the enterprise customers up level their training or help users engage with technology in a more human centric way? Because at the end of the day, I think that that's one of the things that both of your companies are enabling is that that natural way of engaging with technology in a much more human centric, you know, way using amazing cutting edge technology, but that at the end of the day, brings it back to us being human. 
Yeah, I think um, I think Odo just gave a great example with uh, with, with hand tracking about uh, that ability for you to gesticulate uh, and communicate in the in a sort of nonverbal sense when you're in the, when you're in a social act, uh, sort of setting. Um, that is, is is really really powerful, um, and you don't you don't sort of necessarily appreciate when you're when you're physic when you're face to face how much of the the communication that you do is through body language. But then if we're also looking at uh, at these sort of training setups, there's a, there's a lot of much more sort of fundamental and practical uses as well to putting down the controllers and not interacting through some kind of proxy, but actually uh, kind of directly using your hands. Um, and a big one for that is a, is a greater sense of agency. Um, and so agency is the feeling that when you do something and a result happens that you actually cause that result. So you feel that you have a uh, greater control over what's happening and also uh, you have a more more responsive interface and uh, hand tracking provides a much greater sense of agency than than controllers. There's not this sort of uh, this this proxy in the way. And you combine that with some of the the activities we've been talking about doing with the training, you know, sort of uh, space shuttles that you're flying where uh, you're really interacting with a lot of different switches and dials or uh, or some of the, uh, the the things in a in a production line um where you can actually start to move your hands in the way that you would in the real world so rather than just clicking a button you're starting to build that muscle memory you're starting to uh, to sort of process and learn those those specific movements that you've got to do that just uh take take you into that scenario rather than you're kind of still uh interacting behind this uh behind this proxy and then probably the most uh the, the most practical benefit of all which is uh is, is the less exciting one, but still super important really, is uh, if you're using hand tracking instead of controllers, you don't have two devices per headset to charge, to clean in the COVID times, to make sure are tethered with the headset, to sort of put back when people walk off with them. And uh, in some training scenarios where you're putting large numbers of people through uh, sort of in batches, that's, uh, that, that, that can be a lifesaver to not have to, uh, <laughs> not have to deal with that, uh, that, that kind of logistics. And then I think like really the uh, if, if we move from hand tracking to, to haptics, which is kind of the other thing that we do, that really just takes it up to the next level. You know, at that point, then not only uh, are you really using your hands to, to to do the things you're interacting with, but actually you get some semblance of feeling back. You start to get a bit of an understanding as to what the uh, sort of feel what you're doing. It further increases that sense of agency, and then also a lot of the sort of the movements and interactions you do in the real world. You do if you're picking something up off the table, for example. You do about eighty percent of that with sight. You kind of look at it and you see your hand move towards it, and then that last twenty percent, you pass that over to the sense of touch. Your eyes move on to the next task, and you start sort of parallel processing. And your uh, your sort of automatic system in your brain then listens for the for the contact, so that you know that you've grabbed the object, and you start to enable to do that, so you can move faster and with greater confidence in the in the activities that you're doing. So, yeah, I think those are. It, it's sensory, right? So it's 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 really quite fundamental mm -hmm. to the to the human experience. That's brilliant. And Orho, what do you want to add to that? Yeah. So, so uh, like very quickly, uh, two examples come to my mind. So so I was just at the Finnish, uh, like a protest artist, like Banksy, uh, a, a, a like artist, and and we had the guy visiting our office uh, like a um, couple of weeks uh, back, and and we had basically taken uh, his, one of his earlier pieces and transformed it into a virtual version. So we included the hand tracking on that one. And, and what was super cool was that he want, he like uh, immediately got how he would be able to like refine that piece. And actually during the next 20 minutes, he was completely in, in some kind of like zone and, and focusing <laughs> on the art and he, Right, like repositioned all of like every single piece of that uh, art piece uh, completely uh, into a new form, and then he was like, "Now this is something that I want to do next." And and can you guys like record uh, this? And 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 uh, can I get a three D model? Well, no, you cannot. It's it's like a proto. Can you like uh, take a full three three sixty tour of this one? And then we made a video for him, and then he started cracking later on on that one. But it's like this that uh, when when the Hand tracking is so natural that you're not kind of like thinking that this is uh, that you're detached from what you're doing, but you're actually engaged in the same way as, as traditionally. Like he had zero learning curve, and that's mm -hmm. also one of the things that I've realized that uh, like every single demo that we have that has hand tracking, and people like uh, realize that. 
they can see their hands and they're actually there it's it's like it takes the immersion to a completely new level when you realize that you do have agents in the world it's not only you like a peeking into a, a different reality but you can actually engage with it and that's a that's super powerful uh, obviously so so the the second example i was about to give was is that with volvo we we start doing uh, like their uh, future car user experience user experience design process in the way that they're driving real cars and real uh, test tracks mm -hmm. uh, at, at uh, like a proper engaging speeds. And they said that if they just ask people to do things in simulators, they are not engaging in the, in the same way as they, they would if they feel that their own life is actually threatened. So you ask them that, can you peek at your like uh, last uh, missed phone calls? Uh, uh, on the on the phone. If you do it in a safe simulator, they look at it like this, and and they can like uh, freely like uh, work on it. Uh, they do it differently than in real life. And then when you when you're actually driving a car on real road, don't do it, obviously. Uh, <laughs> then then you're like uh, peeking at it quickly, and it's a com completely different behavior. And and you cannot ask them to repeat that behavior. And and what they have then been doing is that. With our eye tracking, they have been uh, running like uh, ways how to, for example, alert people in in threatening situations. So, like uh, a child comes uh, uh, running r running through the corner just when you're looking at the at the phone, and then how does that car make you like uh, realize that this is happening? Give you the opportunity to slam on the brakes and and so forth. Uh, how does the heads up display alert of this uh, activity? Of course, I'm sure that their car would actually do emergency brake at mm -hmm. at uh, the catastrophic low uh, timing. But but you still typically have time to like be proactive as well. And and they have been like running focus group studies who are mm -hmm. all driving on the real roads and and running these like eye tracking analytics on top of that one, realizing that. How, if we let people know of this activity with this blinking sound or or blink, blinking uh, 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 alert or with this kind of sound, what's the behavior? How is it different than the other? And and really designing for the humans. And it's interesting how you can uh, do these things much more effectively with immersive technologies than in any any mm -hmm. other way. Yeah, and I mean, those are great examples. And when you're talking about uh, the artists using the device and, and how they're using spatial computing, I can only imagine if you were, you know, if you were to get Beeple, the digital artist that just sold this NFT for $16 million, if you were to get him into a Vario device, what he would do, oh my goodness, um, I can't even imagine. <laughs> that would be amazing. Um, yeah. So I wanna, you know, I I, I know we're, we only have a couple of minutes before we open it up to questions from the audience. Um, so, you know, I am a futurist, so I always wanna talk about the future and kind of where, where people see things going. So let's take a few minutes to see, where do you see the future of mixed reality and spatial computing going in the next one to five years? Like what are some of the things that you're seeing or that you're excited about? So Tom, let's start with you. Yeah, sure. I think it's, it's, it's always a, uh, a, a, maybe you're used to it, but it's always a big question, right? What's the, what's the world going to look like in five years? Place your bets yeah. now and we'll remember it. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it's possible to get right. But um, I really do think like in, in, in the next five years, we will start to see that that metaverse come into, come into being, that uh, start having persistent virtual content that lives alongside us in the real world. And there are some really, really cool augmented reality tech coming through. Uh, like I'm a big fan of Mojo Vision, which is sort of uh, like augmented reality contact lenses. Sidebar, I never really uh, realized until I looked at those that you can still see them when you close your eyes, which is particularly uh, particularly interesting to think about. But um, yeah, everybody's talking about these, the, you know, the, the sort of AR glasses, the sort of slimline things you're going to wear uh, all the time. But actually, this kind of time frame, I really think that some of the, the best uh, metaverse the best augmented reality uh, experiences are going to be done with pass-through video um, that's where you can get the highest quality visuals and uh, here i have to say i think that uh, bio is absolutely on the right path with the xr3 pass-through high resolution displays you then combine that with having persistent content around you in the world and uh, you know your, your your real hands to be able to interact with both physical and digital uh, content and have those two things into uh, sort of live in the same uh, the same uh, reality with the same laws of physics i think is going to create some uh, create some amazing experiences so 
uh, yeah, my money's on pass through AR and uh, and persistence. Yeah, I mean, yeah, as as Tom put it, it's a it's a big question. Now, um, I I also think that metaverse is now not just a word. It's it's now the beginning of something new, a, a new form of communication, and and I do believe that. Um, Immersive technologies allow us to be more humane in the communication than ever before. And, and when we look at like uh, what we can do today with Zoom and uh, how that has transformed uh, like a typical, typical communication uh, uh, between the people, it's, uh, it's still not quite personal. We are only talking heads and everybody tries to be like a focus to look uh, good uh, on those sessions. But uh, you miss so much of the like a uh, uh, like a closeness that you get when you're actually in the same room and and metaverse is going to be the thing that enables us to achieve that uh, the next best way after uh, being actually physically present obviously and and uh, as part of that one I think that the activities like what example Microsoft has been talking about with the mesh activity of of like holoportation, these kind of things, they are now starting to become real. And and when we look at the like a uh, five years uh, into the future, we will have hundreds of millions of immersive headsets in people's heads. And and we have the technology to make it so that people feel the same kind of naturalness in their communication as they do when they're actually physically in the same place. They just don't need to travel anymore that much which will mean that people have more of these personal sessions than ever before. And I, I think that's going to be like the biggest breakthrough that we're going to see in this decade when it comes to like overall technologies um, impact to people's everyday lives. Yeah, and, and I completely agree. You know, part of the work I do is at uh, Avatar Dimension, which is a volumetric capture studio, a Microsoft mixed reality certified studio and exciting things are coming when it comes to to holoportation and holograms for sure. Um, you know, and I love that you guys both mentioned the metaverse. Obviously that's a, a pl place that I do a lot of work. Uh, you know, I've been writing for Forbes for a long time. Most of my work is with clients wanting to enter the metaverse. Um, so definitely, you know, definitely I keep, uh, I keep kind of a running list called the metaverse weekly in Forbes where I cover everything that's happening. So if, if this, if the metaverse is of interest to anyone listening to this, definitely check that out because you can kind of stay updated on what's happening in that space. Um, so now I want to take a few questions from the audience um, that have come in. Uh, I'm going to take the first one is from David Wood. Uh, he said, how does how does the Vario headset compare with systems such as Microsoft HoloLens or Magic Leap that have received a great deal of public attention? So that's for you, Uro. OK, so so biggest difference is that uh, we use virtual reality technologies to create completely immersive field of view. So uh, look at like. Um, 115 degrees, like your whole field of view, is what we can create with our displays. Simultaneously, we capture the world with uh, video cameras. We digitize it in real time with really no latency whatsoever, and then mix it with the virtual content, which means that we can uh, uh, create mixed reality in your whole field of view, as opposed to a small letter box that you can achieve with both the HoloLens as well as with the, with the um, uh, Magic Leap 1. And and, uh, and 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 then secondly, of course, everything that these uh, optical see-through devices generate, uh, it always remains ghost-like because you cannot create blackness. You can only add light in these optical see-through systems. Now with video see-through that we do, everything is just data. We can manipulate it in any way we want. We can create shadows. Vario, by the way, means shadow in uh, Finnish. Um, and and that's the like the foundation uh, for the technology as well. And and those are like the biggest things. The the caveat is that at the moment, when we look at the highest fidelity possible, our devices are cable connected to a very high powered PC, and that's going to be uh, the state of things for quite some time. But we may have some announcements on that in the near ish future. That's exciting. <laughs> um, and we have a question from Sony Sony Thacker. What are the most exciting advancements being made within fashion in buying spaces using haptics and VR? So, Tom, let's start with you, and then we'll go to uh, to Orho to see if there's anything you want to add. Yeah, so a, a few really cool things. I think one that um, has really 
uh, had a lot of attention, particularly over the last year, is about uh, trying to recreate the, the the feeling of of fabric and uh, and and material, particularly th th thinking of the, the the fashion industry there, so that you can feel that at home. And one of the key the key challenges there is actually getting that information. Like getting you have a, a pair of jeans or, a, or 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 a top. Like how do you actually get the information as to how it feels? And there's a few companies doing some very cool work and actually like automatically sensing what that uh, what that material is. There's a project here in, in Bristol where I am called called Tactip that's uh, that's making some good roads there. And there's a, a great company called Syntouch that's uh, got their really advanced robotic fingertip for, for doing this sensing. Mm -hmm. And then one other cool thing that I um, that I think is, uh, is 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 coming fast is is these sort of like virtual showrooms where rather than going to a shop to try everything, try out all the different products, you can go to a location uh, and then look through all the different products that you might want to buy in a store in in three D sat in front of you and sort of change them, customize them, and experience them. And something that came a little bit sort of left field for me is one of the places that's going to happen is in the back of cars. So as uh, cars move towards autonomous driving, uh, you no longer own your car. Sort of companies operate large fleets. You hit a button and an autonomous car pop, pops up. Uh, one of the locations where for this kind of like uh, shopping experience is going to happen is in the back of those vehicles while you're being taken to wherever it is that you're going. So um, it could be a, a, a pretty convenient and uh, and cool setup there. Yeah, for sure. Or do you want to add anything, or should we go on to more questions? I, I think that was really well uh, said. So let's Brilliant. take the next one. Awesome. The next one is from Paul Clulo. Is there a worry that with installation arts that use these technologies, it will be lost when the exhibit or exhibition ends? Hmm. That's interesting. I mean, it could live on in it, the metaverse, though, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like for the first time, um, like uh, they they can always be relived, even mm -hmm. including that place that they were in because you can further for example do a 3d scan of the place as well and then you can revisit how that art piece looked in rome how it was it in paris and and so forth so you can relive these experiences again and uh, again and, and see the different perspectives yeah uh, we've got two more questions so i'll be very quick with these the next one is from nick ajdarian i hope i said that right uh, the latency of your sense of touch is super low do you have to add sound or visual cues to reinforce the haptic feedback? Will telepresence with haptic feedback ever be possible? Ooh. Yeah, so it's really great questions. So um, actually, I would, I would separate out latency from the sort of like uh, audio or visual, visual clues to reinforce them, because latency is about does the, uh, mm -hmm. does the feedback appear at the right time? And then the sort of audio visual cues are about reinforcing them to make you perceive it as being stronger or, 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 or more noticeable. So latency of those two I see as being the most important. Uh, if there's a gap of more than 20 milliseconds between you doing an action and you feeling the, the response, you notice it. And then that like hugely degrades the confidence in, uh, in what you're doing. Um, so for our, uh, our technology, we use sound waves. So yeah, sort of the, the feedback travels at the speed of sound towards your hand. So uh, as long as you're operating, you know, not Many many meters away from the uh, from the uh, from the from the device, then the latency is very very low. We get well under twenty milliseconds, usually another around sort of five to ten milliseconds there. And then, will it be possible to have haptic feedback with telepresence? Absolutely, um, like that's already possible to achieve today. The challenges are getting it hyper realistic. And actually, I think the uh, the target a little bit like sound in movies. It's not about making it totally accurate to uh, to the real world it's about meeting people's expectations like your expectations of the sound of somebody walking on a gravel path in the hollywood is like way over exaggerated and we need to kind of apply these foley artist techniques to haptics for telepresence awesome Uro, do you want to give us the last word on that no, I like totally agreed. It's it is a super uh, difficult problem so interaction i believe is a bigger uh, uh, problem overall uh, than than for example what we have been working on the on the headsets itself like creating that uh, like a visual uh, 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 virtual reality but then uh, making it feel tangible it's a uh, it's a super interesting problem sphere but but not our forte. 
<laughs> well, thank you so much, Tom and Ruho, for you know joining me for this fantastic panel. I think it was very enlightening. Um, and yeah, you know, we're just you know excited to be able to share the stage with stage with you guys at Cogex. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having us. Kathy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow, that was such an incredible discussion. And I've kind of my mind is blown by thinking about how all of these spatial computing enabled technologies will transform our interactions and our education and our training and even visits to art galleries. Thanks so much to Kathy, Tom, and Oho. To everyone in the audience, remember to come back in 20 minutes where we're going to talk about the ethics of neuroscience. And I hope everyone's having a really fantastic festival so far. See you back here in 20.